There is no book that tells the story of America. Not everything, not all. For each familiar face, there are unnumbered and forgotten heroes. For every celebration, unsung adventures that helped to shape the nation. The usual tale is woven out of English names, but there were others who took part in the building. Before the pilgrims cleared the woods, there were Italians in the Southwest Indian Territory, Venetian craftsmen blowing glass in the Virginia colony, Italians in America, an untold story. classroom textbooks. Search among the names of those who dared the wilderness. You will find no mention of Tonti, Orvigo, Mangarini, or Mazzucchelli. And yet, Italians were the first to come. Children of the Renaissance, touched with genius. God's gift to them, a special talent for exploring. Michelangelo, venturing to the farthest limits of poetry in stone. Da Vinci, marking new boundaries in man's inventions. Galileo, an earthbound astronaut mapping the constellations. Dante, striking out across the terrifying landscape of good and evil. And their countrymen from Genoa, fiery, red-headed Cristoforo Colombo. Columbus and his mutinous crew. Dogs of the sea, sweepings of the docks, journeying past all known lands into nothingness until they stumbled up at dawn and saw before them, thin but dead ahead, the line of unimaginable coast. John Cabot coming next, setting out in 1498 to claim his newfound land for England, his royal letter of patent revealing his true origin behind the altered name, the king authorizing our well-beloved Giovanni Caboto, citizen of Venice, to sail to all parts, countries, and seas of the East under our banners and ensigns. Domenico Vespucci, braving typhoon winds to reach the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. The first to call it Mundus Novus, the New World. Giovanni da Verenzano, following in 1524, crossing the coast of the Carolinas, heading north to enter New York Harbor 85 years before Henry Hudson. Then, north again to Maine. The first Italians in the New World they were not many, considering how few, the part they played is all the more amazing. It was the individualist who made the voyage, adventurers and artisans. And men of God come to the wilds to bring the Indians to Jesus. Fra Marco Stanitza, more than a hundred years before the Mayflower drops anchor, he rides his small, rough-coated, wild plains pony north out of Mexico, crossing the sun-scorched desert, pushing on as far as what is now Nebraska. Less than 10 years have passed since the Dutch traded blue beads for Manhattan, when a Venetian sailor, Cesare Alberto, jumps ship to settle in New Amsterdam. There are still wolves prowling the Puritan settlements in 1644, when Francesco Brassani makes his way through the solitary forest to live among the Iroquois at what will one day be Albany, New York. Italians in the New World. Discoverers with half-forgotten names. Their exploits all but vanished in the mists of time. Enrico Tonti, hard-bitten soldier, 
with an iron claw taking the place of a hand lost in battle, second in command to La Salle. Making the nightmare voyage across Lake Michigan in a birch bark canoe, living on acorns, boot leather, and a little blessed brandy. Discovering the Illinois River, founding Fort Heartbreak on the present site of Peoria, then down the Mississippi, trading for furs. We sailed on until the brackish water turned to brine, and the broad sweep of the great gulf opened out before us. In the brittle pages of old books, find the mention of those who made the journey from Sicily and San Remo, Ravenna and Rome, a certain Grimaldi with Oglethorpe at the founding of Georgia, a certain Bautista Antonelli, military architect in charge of building forts in Florida. The 13 colonies are in their infancy. Paul Revere is 12 years old, Young Ben Franklin, a loyal subject of the king, has just written his first song. Twas honest old Noah first planted a vine And mended his morals by drinking the wine Virtue and safety in wine drinking's found While all that drink water deserve to be drowned A surgeon in Philadelphia a shipwright in New Haven, the Priolo family in South Carolina, the Palavincis in Virginia. Honorio Rasolini, armorer and keeper of the stores for the colony of Maryland. Time turns in its seasons. In New York, Giovanni Palma presents a concert of Italian chamber music. Signora Mazzanti gives a recital of Italian songs. Francis Alberti is teaching Tom Jefferson to play the violin. At Monticello, Jefferson's friend and neighbor is Filippo Mazzei, farmer and philosopher, growing grapes from Tuscan cuttings, writing articles on freedom, planting seeds that will ripen into revolution. A truly republican form of government cannot exist except where all men, from the very rich to the very poor, are equal in their natural rights. Elsewhere, there's more violent music in the air. Winds of rebellion blowing from Boston Harbor to the Blue Ridge Mountains. America's a powder keg. On the quiet country road to Lexington and Concord, the redcoats light the fuse. At Philadelphia, the Continental Congress meets to declare for independence. Among the signers, William Parker, Chief Justice and Governor of Maryland. From Marblehead to Mobile Bay, Italian Americans snatching up their muskets, marching with the Continentals. Mazzei, Bellini, Vincenzo Rossi, fighting under Patrick Henry in the Virginia militia. Major Cosimo Medici galloping to battle with the North Carolina Light Dragoons. Forty-nine sons of the Fonda family in the ranks, along with Pasquale de Angelis, private in the infantry. Age, 13. The price of liberty comes high. Colonel Richard Taliaferro killed at the Battle of Guilford Hall. Lieutenant Bracco, dead at White Plains. Palle Bonaventura, dead at Yorktown. The future of the newborn nation opens west. The Indians camp along the Beyond the farthest mountains, Alessandro Malespina sails at the head of a scientific expedition mapping the Pacific coast from Mexico to Alaska. While pioneers of Italian descent push into the unexplored frontier, 
Colonel Francis Vigo, paddling up the Ohio into the Northwest Territory to make peace with the Chickasaws. Camping with the Sioux in Wisconsin, Father Samuel Mazzucchelli. In Minnesota, Nathan Taliaferro, agent to the Chippewas. Father Anthony Ravelli, toting medicines and a Bible in his saddlebags, doctoring the Winnebago's. And out in the Oregon Territory, Gregorio Mangarini compiling a dictionary of the Flathead language. In Charlottesville, stonemasons from the Piemonte, brought over by Jefferson, helped build the University of Virginia. Off the coast of Boston, Salvatore Catellano serves as sailing master of the U.S. frigate Constitution. Old Ironsides establishing America's right to freedom of the seas. In Augusta, Georgia, John Finizzi has just been elected mayor. In New York City, Lorenzo De Ponte, author of the libretto for Mozart's Don Giovanni, Figaro, and Cosi Fan Tutti, is serving as the first professor of literature at Columbia and helping to found an opera house. Six hundred Italians, just off the boat in slam-bang, booming San Francisco. And blow ye winds high for California. There's plenty of gold, so I've been told, on the banks of Sacramento. New York. Antonio Meucci is inventing the first primitive version of the telephone, 26 years before Alexander Graham Bell. In Washington, Constantino Brumidi is painting his frescoes in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. I no longer have any desire for fame or fortune. My one ambition is that I may live long enough to make beautiful the one country on earth in which there is liberty. But for the black man, liberty is still a dream that comes to life in a rattle of gunfire that almost destroys the nation. Two brothers on their way, one wore blue and the other wore gray, one Americans taking up arms for the North, forming the Garibaldi Guards, plunging into the bloody confusion at Cemetery Ridge, 15 dead and 80 wounded. From the long roll call, choose a few to stand for the many. Rear Admiral Bancroft Gerardi, under fire at Mobile Bay. Edward Ferraro, the only general to take command of an all-black combat division. Brigadier General Francesco Spinola, twice wounded at Wapping Heights. Corporal Edward Venuti, killed at Gettysburg. And their brothers of Italian descent fighting for the South. 500 in Louisiana's European Brigade. In the Alabama Infantry, the Mississippi Cavalry, a colonel and two captains from George's Finizzi family. One dead at Manassas. Most spectacular of all, Lieutenant Colonel Luigi Palma di Cesnola, commander of four regiments of Union cavalry, leading a charge point blank into the rebel cannon, his bravery rewarded with the Congressional Medal of Honor. After four years of slaughter, the guns fall silent. A shattered nation binds its wounds, mourns the murder of a president, turns to the job of taming the frontier. In the Wild West, Angelo Charlie Seringo, son of an Italian immigrant, starts herding longhorns at 14, chases rustlers into Mexico, leads the posse that captures Billy the Kid at Stinking Springs. For the newcomers, the dangers of the frontier are more than rattlesnakes and desperados. 
a narrow-minded, ugly hatred of foreigners. In Tonti Town, Arkansas, a community of 40 Italian families is attacked by vigilantes. Their schoolhouse burned. Their men forced to arm themselves to protect their wives and children. But, by and large, America in the 1880s is a peaceful country, enjoying a bicycle ride of prosperity and progress. Civil War veteran Luigi Palma di Cesnola has come back from his post as ambassador to Cyprus to become the first director of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Until now, Italians in America have been the sons and daughters of the early settlers, descendants of those who fought the revolution and opened the West, braved the cannon fire at Gettysburg and Bull Run. Italian Americans, artists, professionals, and skilled craftsmen, mostly living in the cities. Music teachers and opera singers, stone cutters and sculptors. The open range is ending now. Barbed wire closing off the great plains, the frontier giving way to the disc plow and the harvester. Buried in the American earth are riches beyond anyone's wildest dreams. A great bonanza of oil and iron ore, coal and copper. Now, in the 1880s, the poor of Europe start to flood into a nation starved for labor. The great age of immigration has begun. From the hills of Abruzzi, from tiny fishing villages along the Mediterranean, from sun-scorched towns south of Rome, the children of Columbus will be coming now. From Salerno and Sorrento, from Calabria and Sicily, they will be coming to dig the coal, roll the steel, pave the streets, to build the railroads, span the rivers. Listen to the jingle, the rumble and the roar, as she rides through the woodland, through the hills and by the shore. Mighty rush of engine, the lonesome whistle squall, riding through the mountains on the Wabash Cannonball. Italian Americans, they will be coming now. Immigrants and the sons of immigrants to shape this vast, rich, half-tamed continent into a modern nation. Heading into the turn of the 20th century, the USA is a nation going places. Skyscrapers going up, steel furnaces glowing, cotton spindles singing. A nation hungry for labor, looking to Europe to supply it. By the year 1900, one third of Americans will be foreign born or the children of foreign born. Almost all the Italians in the great wave of immigration will come from the areas east and south of Rome. The harsh, and merciless Mezzogiorno. Mezzogiorno, the land that time forgot. For the favorite few who can find work, lunch is a slice of hard bread dipped in oil. Dinner, a plate of beans. Meat is a miracle, tasted only by those on whom God smiles. Field hands from the villages, stone masons from Sant'Angelo, fishermen from Messina, the unskilled poor of Palermo and Naples, burdening themselves with debt, pledging their future earnings for the privilege of a few inches of space in the stinking steerage, staggering off the boat at Ellis Island to be tagged and numbered, shoved through a machine-gun fire of questions from medical examiners and immigration officials, 
bringing their music, their laughter, their desperate dreams, they came at last to Vespucci's new world, to be greeted with something less than open arms. A New York newspaper complaining, The floodgates are open. Europe is vomiting its scum upon our shores. Settling in rat-infested slums of Boston and Chicago, the teeming tenements of New York's Mulberry Bend. Oh, when you son de la montagnella, Lulu pussy mangia la pecorella, mamma. The old country. They told me the streets of America were paved with gold. When I got here, I learned three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they were not paved at all. Third, I was expected to pave them. and canals, dams and bridges, cutting timber in Michigan and granite in Vermont, mining coal in Pennsylvania and iron ore in Minnesota, rolling cigars in Tampa, killing hogs in Kansas City, laboring in the brickyards of St. Louis's Dago Hill, laying cross ties and hard steel from Cincinnati to California. At sunrise, we climbed off the hand cars and started laying track. There was no let up, no mercy. With nothing but coffee in the morning and bread at noon, we worked 10 hours every day in the blistering sun and pouring rain. Picking cranberries on Cape Cod and strawberries in Louisiana, raising beans and sweet potatoes in Vineland, New Jersey, growing peaches in North Carolina, cotton and tobacco in Mississippi. Yet everywhere he turns in the land of the free, the Italian immigrant runs into a wall of prejudice. America has never been a land known for patience. It's easier to stereotype the newcomers than to take the time to understand them. Call this group lazy and that one greedy. Label them drunkards or mark them as criminals. Use the failings of a few as a tar brush to smear the many. Spotlight the one who breaks the law and ignore the millions who uphold it. In the streets, in the newspapers, on the vaudeville stage, he is the guinea, the greaser, the dumb dago. Well, me not speak a good English, I no can understand. What do you Stereotypes, prejudice, and blind hatred. In 1891, several Italians lynched in West Virginia. In 1893, several more murdered in Denver, Colorado. Six torn from a jail in Hannibal, Louisiana. Three of them hanged. Five Sicilian shopkeepers strung up in Tallulah, Louisiana for the unforgivable offense of treating black customers the same as whites. Still, there are those who make their way in this new world carving their names in the American grain. In April 1906, earthquake and fire leave San Francisco in smoldering ruins. Most of the banks are destroyed, their underground vaults too hot to enter. Only Amadeo Giannini, proprietor of a small bank in the North Beach section, has ready cash on hand. Propping a plank across two barrels, he starts making loans for the rebuilding of the city. If a man is unknown to him, Giannini asks to see his hands. Calluses serve as security. In New York, Francis Xavier Cabrini is founding the orphanage that will lead to a nationwide network of day nurseries and schools, rest homes and hospital services for poor Italians. Works of mercy that will make her the first American citizen elevated to sainthood. In Washington, Charles Bonaparte has appointed Teddy Roosevelt Secretary of the Navy, later to be Attorney General and father of the FBI. While in New Orleans, when the police chief is killed, there is an outcry against Sicilians. 
Ten are arrested, tried, and acquitted. A mob that contains many of the city's leading citizens storms the prison, guns them down, and for good measure, hangs an eleventh serving a minor sentence for some petty crime. Bewildered by the strange language, wary of ragtime America, they keep to their own neighborhoods. The little Italies that spring up in a dozen cities across the nation. Centuries of oppression have taught them to trust only in La Familia, a close-knit circle of blood relatives, including cousins, aunts, and uncles. Chi lascia la via vecchia per la nuova Whoever forsakes the old way for the new knows what he is losing, but not what he will find. The way of the children is la via nuova, and step by step their parents are drawn into the mainstream. Going out to work in the sweatshops, the textile mills, the building trades, forming unions, fighting for a living wage. Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. The boom of cannon fire in Europe seems a long way off until a German torpedo sinks the U.S. passenger ship Lusitania. Goodbye, Ma, goodbye, Pa, goodbye, Mule, with the old hee-haw. I may not know what the war's about, but I bet by gosh I'll soon find out. Four hundred thousand Italian-Americans in uniform. Peppery little Major Fiorello LaGuardia, now a congressman, one day to be mayor of New York City, flying an open biplane over the Alps to bomb enemy Austria. 83 Italian-Americans awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. 4% of the United States population, they make up more than 10% of the casualty lists. Armistice Day at last, and in its wake, a brutal roundup of so-called foreign agitators. Socialist and anarchist immigrants scooped up in midnight arrests, dragged off to detention pens, held without charges, deported without trial. In Massachusetts, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, an immigrant factory worker and a poor fish peddler, hauled up on murder charges. The prosecuting attorney insulting Italian-American defense witnesses, appealing to the prejudices of a bigoted judge and jury. Vanzetti writing on the eve of execution. I would not wish to a dog or a snake, to the most low and misfortunate creature on the earth, what I have had to suffer for things I am not guilty of. I have suffered because I was an Italian, and indeed, I am an Italian. And so America headed into the terrific 20s. From Waterbury, Connecticut to Whiskey Gap, Kentucky. From Waco to Wichita. Women swooning over Rudolf Valentino, movie idol, immigrant from Italy. While in Washington, they pass a law discriminating against immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, reducing the Italian quota from 40,000 to less than 4,000. Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929. The stock market takes a nosedive and America is in the Great Depression. Almost overnight, 15 million unemployed. Living in shanty towns they call Hoovervilles, shacks made out of old packing crates and flattened tin cans. Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House. A new deal putting the jobless back to work. Luigi Antonini of the Ladies' Garment Workers joining John Lewis of the Mine Workers and Philip Murray of the Steel Workers to form the CIO. Organize the unorganized. 
battle for job security. By the late 30s, America is back on its feet. While in Europe, a long night of violence and murder is falling over the continent, making it dangerous for those who believe in freedom. Repression in the homeland of their ancestors, Italian Americans are among the first to recognize the dangers of fascism. Before the bloodletting, they managed to rescue a few. Thank you.